Well, let me read another text regarding the, uh, the, the birth of our Lord Jesus. Actually, this takes place after the birth of Jesus. Sometimes we forget that when the Magi come, that Jesus is already about two years old. So um, he's been in Bethlehem, no longer in, in the, you know, the, the stable, no longer in the manger. Um, now they're living in some kind of a house. And we know this because uh, when the Magi don't return to Herod, Herod sends his soldiers out to kill every male child two years and, and younger because the star appeared two years earlier. So this, this though, again, is a part of uh, what our Lord was doing to preserve his son so that he might complete his work, so that we might be saved. So let me read this uh, in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, Report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Well, may the Lord again bless his word to our understanding this morning. May he also give me a voice to continue <clears throat> to be able to talk to the end of the, of the service. Well, today, as you know, we again celebrate uh, the gift that God gave to us so many years ago, the gift of his only begotten son, the babe born of the virgin, laid in a manger, heralded by the angels, marveled at by the shepherds, worshipped by the magi. Now, unlike any other gift or all the other gifts we'll receive at Christmas, this one really cannot be appreciated unless we understand what our lives would have been like without him. So this morning, what I'd like to do is back up to the beginning, to what God originally gave us when he created us and his purpose, what it is we lost and what we would have to face apart from the gift of this child. I want us to look at the hope that he gave us uh, in his promise in the garden and in what he did through the centuries. And then I want us to see this hope realized in his sending his son into the world to save us. So the first thing I want us to, to do is to consider that we needed hope. Now, I've already told you this, but let me again preface what I'm going to say this morning by pointing out that what we have read in the Bible and what we're going to be looking at in the Bible, whether in the Old Testament or in the New, it all really has to do with us, doesn't it? This is our history. You know, as we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, really become our fathers as well as the fathers of the Jew. What was lost in the garden was actually our loss. What was promised in the garden was actually promised to us. And what this promised child did when he came into the world, he did for us. If we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are believing in him, we need to see that we are a part of this history, what God did, he did for us. 
Now, let's first of all begin with what it is that God originally intended. When He first created us, we do need to remember that He made us so that we might live with Him. Now, this is important because this is ultimately what Jesus is going to bring back to us is what we had originally with the Lord, only it's going to be better on the other end than it would have been here, but it's still very, very good. When God originally created us, He made us so that we could live with Him. He gave us a perfect body that would never die. He gave us a perfect heart that wanted only to please Him, that, only, that really loved Him most of all. And He gave us a perfect place to live, okay? He gave us a beautiful garden, a garden that was well watered, a garden full of delicious things to eat. It was just the right temperature and very easy to take care of. Sounds like a wonderful place to live. But what really made this paradise to be paradise wasn't the condition in which God made us or the surroundings or the provisions. What made it paradise was that God was there. Jonathan Edwards tells us that this is really what makes heaven to be heaven for a believer. It's why we want to be in heaven, because God is there. J.C. Ryle also wrote that this is the reason why no unbeliever would ever want to go to heaven because if you don't love God, you're certainly not going to enjoy being around Him. Well, the true believer loves the Lord, and that's what the Lord originally made us. Those who love Him, those who walked with Him, those who had fellowship with Him. Now, if Adam and Eve had persevered, if they had obeyed the Lord as the Lord had intended, this is the garden we would have been born in. This is the state that we would have been born in. This paradise that we call the Garden of Eden wouldn't have remained a small garden, but eventually it would have filled the earth. Now think about this. And this is going to be important also for what we're going to see this evening. We would all be living in peace. Peace with everyone. Peace with all of our relatives, right? Because everyone in the world is really related to us because we all come from one set of parents. We would be living at peace with everyone who had ever been born because nobody would die and we would all be alive from the very beginning to the present. We would all have been working together to discover what this world has to offer. Remember the Lord said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, I want you to have dominion over the earth and cultivate it. And what he meant by that was he wanted us to bring forth what it was capable of doing for the glory of the Lord. Now, we are doing that today, but we're doing it pretty much for our own glory, not, not the church, but people in the world, rather than the Lord's glory. But we would see not only what we see today with regard to the modern technologies that have been developed, but we would see much more because there'd be no sickness, there'd be no death, there would be no second law of thermodynamics, you know, that makes us have to always fix everything and have to clean up everything because everything is, is moving towards increasing random, randomness. Everything would just be getting better and better as together we serve the Lord with everyone in the world. But as you know, even though that's what the Lord originally created and what would have happened if Adam and Eve had obeyed, this was not meant to be. Adam sinned against the Lord. He ate of the forbidden tree. Not just for himself, but representing us, he sinned for all of us, and he brought the consequences of sin upon all of us, and we began to die. Remember what God said to Adam when he was in the garden with regard to the tree, in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So death began to work within us. We could no longer live in paradise. We were put out of the sanctuary of God, out of His presence, into the world, a world which is now under a curse, which would make everything so much harder to do. And as you know, that's the reason why we face famines, why we face droughts. By the way, I felt an earthquake yesterday. Did you feel that earthquake? Seems like they're becoming more and more common around here. But that's why we have to face earthquakes and hurricanes. That's why there are tsunamis. That's why we get sick. That's why the medical field exists. That's why there is such a thing as chemo and radiation treatments. That's why there are morgues. 
and cemeteries and why one day we're all going to be in those places. Now, worst of all, when we sinned in Adam, God sent us away out of his presence and he very justly condemned us to eternal damnation. I know that's not very popular to talk about in churches today, damnation, but that's exactly what we deserve. We sinned against an infinitely holy God. Every sin deserves really hell. And so how much more all the sins we have committed against him. And so the situation has changed. Now instead of coming into a perfect world with a perfect body, with a perfect heart, we come into a fallen world with a very imperfect body and innate hatred of God. That's the way we come into the world. Guilty and on our way to a future, a place that is so horrible that really no words can describe it. So let me just describe it in that way, a place that is so horrible that it cannot be described. Jonathan Edwards did his best, and when some people thought he exaggerated, um, basically his, his defender, John Gerstner, said, there's no way you can exaggerate what hell is like. Endless suffering it goes on eternally with no intermission. So no words can really describe. We were without God. We were without hope in the world, but God, in his mercy, gave us hope. Now, this is what makes, of course, the coming of Christ to be so glorious. It's, it's not that we were on our way to heaven, and this is like a little perk along the way. We were destined for hell. We were destined for eternal suffering, and this child was the only one who could actually save us from that. This is what we need to see, first of all, as, again, the glory of Christ. But we also need to remember He is wonderful. He is glorious. He is beautiful. And that's the reason why we embraced Him. So secondly, let's look at the promise that God gave and how He developed that through the centuries. Before God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden, uh, out of paradise, He gave them a promise. He would bless the woman with a child which means he would be a part of our race. She didn't know how far off in the future that was, but we know it was you know, a number of years, uh, depending upon your chronology of the world. It was around 4,000 years or so. He would be born far in the future. This child would fight against the devil who had destroyed us. Remember, Adam and Eve ate of the, of the tree because Satan had tempted them. And this child would break his power over us by giving his own life for us this is what the Lord said to the, to the woman, or actually to the serpent, but regarding the woman. Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Really, the whole gospel is wrapped up in this statement. And along with this statement, I want you to realize that when, when Adam and Eve eight of the tree, they actually sided with the serpent. They became a part of his camp and his kingdom. But God says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, which means I'm going to separate the woman to me, and I am going to also separate through the centuries your children and her children. But this particular seed that I'm going to give her is going to crush your head. And in the process, he is going to be also injured, and we know that he was actually going to die. It was because of this promised child that God could bring us back to himself. It's on the basis of this that he brought Adam and Eve back to himself. Throughout the many years before he sent this child in, into the world, he was showing mercy on the basis of this child, you see, that he was going to send into the world. And through the centuries, he continued to draw his people's attention to him. Let me give you a few examples. I mean, really, the, the, the Old Testament is full of them. God had Noah build an ark to save himself and his household from God's judgment. Mankind had grown so evil that they were threatening to destroy his people, and so God sent a flood to destroy them, but he saved Noah and his family so that he might bring his, his, this child into the world. I need you to see here that he reset the clock, as it were, 
We had reached the point where God's judgment had come. The world was so evil that God had to judge it, but that he might send his son into the world to save his people. He saved Noah and his family and continued that work. He was also showing us here that a day of judgment was coming. This, this was a day of judgment, but it was also a picture of the final judgment that was coming when God would again destroy the world, not with water, but this time with fire. But the ark reminds us that we would only be safe if we were in his ark of safety, the child that he was to send. You see, that ark was a picture of Jesus. Now, after the flood, earth's population again began to grow and their evil along with it. They decided they would band together and build a tower that would keep them united, one that would reach to heaven to symbolize their rebellion against God. The implication almost seems to be that they were going to build a tower that would reach up into heaven so that they could lay hands on God, as it were, and bring Him down in order to destroy Him. And so to postpone the judgment and fulfill His promise to save us, He again reset the clock. He divided them by changing their languages so they could no longer understand one another. They stopped building the tower and went their own way. So again, God bringing this, this, in order to bring this work to its completion. He's at work in the world, keeping evil from getting too great. He called Abraham when he was very old and childless, and he made his covenant with him, promising him that he would have as many children as the stars in heaven or as the sand on, uh, of the seashore, and that from his line one would come through whom all the nations would be blessed. That child, that promised seed, uh, I should say that that one child he promised through whom all the nations would be blessed was the promised seed of the woman. And the children, all of us, who would put our trust in him. We do need to understand that Abraham did have a lot of physical children. The the children of Israel were, were quite numerous, right? We also need to understand what Paul tells us in the New Testament, that though the children of Israel be as the stars in the heaven or as the sand in the sea, it's only a remnant that is going to be saved. What he's referring to here, of course, are those who believe like Abraham. Listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 3.7. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Moses was sent into Egypt to redeem God's people from their slavery to the Egyptians. God was showing us that he was going to send this child into the world to redeem us from our slavery into sin. Before they left Egypt, God commanded his people to sacrifice a lamb and to put its blood on the doorposts and lintels of their homes so that the angel of death, which God was sending to judge the Egyptians, would pass over and their firstborn would be spared. He was showing us here that the child would be sacrificed and that through the shedding of his blood, judgment, God's judgment would pass over us. Moses led God's people in the wilderness. When they became thirsty, they began to murmur against God and he told Moses to strike this rock in order that water may come out. The Lord was showing us here that through the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ, basically of this child, by his being struck, we would receive the water of his Holy Spirit to make us new creatures. Now, how do we know this is what all this means? Because this is the way the New Testament looks back on the Old Testament. These are so many pictures of our coming Lord. The Lord told Moses to build a tabernacle that he might, that his God might dwell with his people and to ordain a priesthood to offer sacrifices by which they might draw near to him. And here the Lord was showing us who this child would actually be, that he would be Emmanuel, God with us. Do you know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the tabernacle? John writes in John 1.14, and the Word, of course, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word there, dwelt, means that he pitched his tent or he tabernacled among us in our nature And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, the priesthood and the sacrifices also showed us what Jesus would do, that he would sacrifice himself. 
in order to draw us near to God. David wanted to build a house for God, but God said, I will build a house for you, David. And what he meant by this was that he was going to send this child through the line of David and establish him as king and his kingdom forever. And then finally, God made a promise to, to make a new covenant with us. We could not keep the old covenant. We could not keep the Mosaic covenant. And when the Lord talks about that in Jeremiah, he's not referring merely to the fact that it was a burden to go through all those rituals in order to maintain this picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what he meant was that we could not keep the commandments that were written on stone. And the reason why God made a new covenant was because they, they wouldn't keep his commandments, they couldn't keep his commandments, and so God makes a covenant in which he gives the ability now to keep those commandments. We, of course, again, could not have kept the commandments of God. And when he made that new covenant, he was making it also for our benefit. He would send this child into the world to keep the law for us, to give us a perfect righteousness. And this child would also, as he grows up, of course, when he's grown, die on the cross for us in order that he might send the Holy Spirit to write his law upon our hearts so that we could obey him. What the first covenant couldn't do, Jesus does. So first of all, we see the need for hope. We were faced with eternal destruction. Secondly, we see the Lord give that hope in that promise in the garden of how he was going to reverse and undo everything the devil had done in destroying us by giving us this child. And then thirdly, we see this, that hope of the promised child realized. The Lord has done what he has promised. When it was time, God sent his angel Gabriel, first to Zacharias to tell him that his wife would bear the, the child's forerunner, as we've already sung in that hymn, Comfort, Comfort Me, My People, the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. And then he sends his angel to Mary to tell her that she had been chosen to give birth to this promised Savior. When her fiancé Joseph saw that Mary was with child, he thought he, she had been unfaithful, naturally so, and he planned to put her away secretly. But Gabriel came to assure him, that she was with child by the Holy Spirit. God then sent them to Bethlehem through the census that this Savior might be born there in order to fulfill what he had said through the prophet Micah in Micah 5.2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity." So many people had come to Bethlehem because of the census. There was no room for them in the inn, so they had to stay in the stable. And you know, the implication of that is simply this, that um, our Lord Jesus, Paul tells us, who was rich, became poor for our sakes, so that through his poverty, we might become rich. And while they were there, she gave birth to a son. And Joseph called his name Jesus, as Gabriel had told him. And the reason why he was named Jesus is because of what the word or the name actually means. It's actually a, a um, contraction of two words in Hebrew, which is Yahweh and Shua, which means okay, Yahweh is the Lord's name, and Shua means salvation, Yahshua. Okay, Joshua, which in, basically in the Greek is Jesus. That's the word. You know, it's basically the, uh, the Greek word for the word Joshua, but the word means the Lord is salvation. The Lord is here. And he is going to save us. Now, the fulfillment of this promise was obviously too important to go unnoticed, and it was taking place in a private setting. And so the Lord sent his angels to announce to some shepherds nearby in Luke 2.11, as we read earlier this morning, today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And the shepherds went quickly to see what the angels had told them, and they found Joseph and Mary and Jesus as he lay in the manger. And they knew what this meant. And they returned praising God. Now again, so far it's confined to the Jews. But it's interesting, two years later, 
these magi, these wise men from the east, they see his star and they come looking for him. And when they found him, they worshiped him. This is something that, that most of the Jewish people didn't do. But here we see these wise men, these magi from the east, these Gentiles coming and worshiping the Savior. They knew who he was. They knew he was king and they knew he was more than a king. We see here the Lord in his mercy was already preparing the way to make this child of Abraham a blessing to all the nations. Well, we know that Jesus grew up. Jesus taught God's truth throughout Palestine. He showed everyone who he was, the Messiah, by healing the sick and raising the dead. And then he willingly went to the cross to bear our sins. Now, the point behind this, of course, is this, that Jesus is our only hope. He is the hope that God promised to Adam and Eve in the garden. He is the, the hope that has been promised to God's people throughout the centuries. He is the one, the only one, who can actually bring us to God, who can bring us back into that state that God made us originally. He alone is able to take away our guilt and to give us the perfect record of righteousness, of obedience that we need in order to enter into paradise, which now, of course, is going to be a new heavens and a new earth because sin has destroyed the old creation where we will live with God as he originally intended. God originally was with Adam and Eve in the garden. In the end, God's people will again live with him. Jesus tells us in his word that the Father sent the Son into the world so that all who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And that doesn't just mean life without end, but it means a quality of life. It means a relationship with God. This is eternal life, Jesus said, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent, and not just know about them, but know them in relationship. The way we come into relationship with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just simply close this morning by asking these questions. Since the only way to have this relationship is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, have you believed in him? Are you trusting what he did to save you and what he did alone? You know, the Bible does say that uh, we're saved by grace and not by works. It's by trusting in what Jesus has done in his righteousness and his death on the cross, not in what we do. And anytime we add our works to what Jesus did, we actually destroy the grace of God. You know, the Galatians added circumcision to what Jesus did, and Paul said, you have fallen from grace. That's a different gospel, and you need to repent of that if you're going to be saved. You can't even add a little thing like circumcision to the work of Christ. It has to be Jesus and Jesus alone. So are you trusting what he has done and what he has done alone to save you? And then, of course, the other diagnostic question, does your life show that you actually are trusting him? Even though we don't work our way to salvation, as we already saw, God made a new covenant in which he gives us the Holy Spirit who writes the law upon our hearts. He gives us the desire to do these things and our lives are transformed from the inside out so that we begin to live the way Jesus calls us to live, not perfectly, but substantially, and we continue to grow. Do you see that at work in your life? Do you see his grace at work? Well, if that's the case, then you are safe. This history that we've just looked at is your history. All that he has promised, all that he has done, he has done for you. And that means that you will one day live with him forever in paradise. It's hard to imagine. Just as words can't describe how horrible hell is, which is what we deserve, words really can't describe how wonderful paradise is going to be when we are finally there with him. This life is just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. This is a brief period of time in our lives. It doesn't really matter what happens here so much. What really matters is that we're going to be there and what happens there so we live in the hope that we are going to be with the Lord. But let me also close with, with this. If you don't believe, if you're not trusting the Lord Jesus, 
If you don't see the Spirit working in your life as the Lord tells us in His Word that He should be, then let me encourage you this morning to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ now and to trust Him now to save you. And if you will do that, the Lord says that He will save you and that you will be safe from that horrible place and you will go to live with Him in paradise when you finally leave this world. Well, may the Lord give you the grace to trust in Him if you haven't trusted in Him. And may the Lord encourage us this morning again as we think about the birth of the, of the Savior that He was born for us. He came to save us. And that is exactly what He has done. Now, as we move towards uh, the Lord's Supper, we need to think about what Jesus did. He grew up and He ministered. He he, uh, you know, he lived for us to give us that righteousness, that obedience, but he also died on the cross in order to pay for our sins. And that's what we turn to as we turn to the Lord's Supper. So what I'd like to do uh, at this point is, is simply read uh, a passage of Scripture from 1 Corinthians to remind us of what it is this is all about and what it is the Lord would have us do to prepare to come to the table. And then we're going to bow for just a couple of moments of silent prayer. And we're going to allow the Lord to search our hearts to confess our sins and to renew our covenant with Him. And then we're going to celebrate the table. So first of all, let me read what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which He was betrayed took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So what we do here, first of all, is we remember the death of our Lord Jesus, that he willingly came into this world, took upon himself the, our obligations in order to receive the blessings of the covenant, did that for us, died in our place, uh, again, that we might have life. He wants us to remember that love, that intent behind that, and the fact that he did it. And then secondly... He wants us to, to examine ourselves, to make sure that we are walking in His ways, that we are, again, considering what, what this is and what it means and whether or not we have been faithful to do what our Lord calls us to do. Now, all of us have not been perfectly faithful. No one has but Jesus. That's why we need His righteousness. And even with His grace, we cannot live perfectly. So we need to, again, acknowledge our sins before the Lord, confess them, and again, express our total reliance, look to Jesus alone for what we need to, to get into heaven. And this is where we renew our covenant with Him, where we again remember the vows that we, make to, we made to the Lord when we first started to follow Him. Ideally, you know, that we join the church and we, we have those five membership vows that, that essentially say, I believe the Bible is God's Word. I believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. I can't do it on my own. I hate my sins and I'm, you know, I, I grieve over them and I, I purpose to turn away from them and from the world and, and everything that is contrary to God and to live a godly life. That's, that's the vow we made to the Lord when we, when we took up His cross, when we believed in the Lord Jesus. Actually, those are the conditions upon which Jesus says, count the cost. Are you going to follow me to the end? This is what's going to cost you all this hardship. But the greatest hardship is just overcoming our sins, fighting against them so that we might live the way our Lord calls us to live. So the question is, 
do we, do we really mean that? And, and are we living that? Um, that's what we need to ask ourselves now as we bow in just a moment of, of silent prayer and prepare to come to the table. So let's pray.